He's the author of the 1986 Mets book, The Bad Guys One, also author of the Walter Payton book, Sweetness, and the book about cowboys, Boys Will Be Boys. Also, SI and CNN contributor Jeff, thanks for coming on tonight, man. How you doing? I'm good. I'm sorry I'm two minutes late. Uh, dude, don't don't worry about it, man. It's uh, Time is of the essence. The fans were clamoring to get the guy on of a great book like you did yourself. And I want to ask you on that note, I mean, what gave you the inspiration to write that book about the 1986 Mets? God, I wish I had some great answer to tell you, but the truth of the matter is I was a... Uh at the time, I was uh, 26 or 27, and I was a baseball writer at Sports Illustrated, and I really wanted to write a book. I didn't know what to write about, and uh, I met with a literary agent named Susan Reed, and she said, uh, have you ever thought about the 86 Mets? And I was like, wow, that's a great idea. So it wasn't, really, it wasn't even my idea, but as soon as uh, it was really a perfect match for me because I was born and raised in New York. I was born in 1972, so 86 was right in my wheelhouse. And, uh, it ended up being a, just a delight, like a real joy for me to write. I mean, and, and, and you look how in-depth that book was. I mean, some of the stories you got from these guys was like the first-hand experience. And, I mean, what was that like? I mean, did you get to interview all these guys on an individual basis? I mean, how did you come about getting in touch with all these guys from the 86 team? Yeah, well, it started actually, um, you know, my goal whenever I write books. I mean, that was my first, so I, I was trying to just figure out how to do it. But my goal has always been to interview absolutely everybody, you know, so... I remember early on in the process, the Mets had a uh, kind of a journeyman reliever named Doug Sisk. He wasn't really a journeyman, but he was kind of marginal, named Doug, mm-hmm. Doug Sisk. And I was interviewing Doug, and he said, uh, yeah, do you, uh, do you want a, uh, I have a, a, a list with all the phone numbers of all the players. Do you have any interest in that? And I was like, uh, yeah, that'd be great, actually. <laughs> so Doug actually gave me this list with all the names and addresses and phone numbers, and uh, that got me started. And, you know, the funny thing is, at the time, um, Gooden, either Gooden or Strawberry was in jail, and the other guy was having all sorts of problems. So I actually didn't interview either of those two guys oh, wow. um, for the book, uh, which you know obviously made things a little more difficult. But that, the, the stories were so colorful; guys were so willing to open up. I, I think for a lot of them, it was like talking about their own, you know, like talking about your old days in a fraternity in college. Uh, you know, mostly joy. And I, I look at that book as a joyful book for me. You know. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it brought joy to me. I have to say, I sat down, I read the entire thing in one sitting. I mean, there were so many of my favorite stories in there, but there's one that stands out to me. And, you know, you just captured it just perfectly in, in the last out. These guys didn't want to get out. They all got to first base, and they all said the same thing. I'm not making the last effing out of this World Series. And it wasn't planned. It wasn't something, you know, that they thought about. And it just kind of happened. And I thought that the way you captured it and the way you told that story was awesome. That was probably my favorite story in that entire book. I, you know, you're actually the first person to bring that up to me in the, all the interviews I've done. Um, and I agree with you. And I remember it was like each guy telling me the same thing. You know, they didn't know. I don't think, you know, they realized. I don't think Ray Knight and, you know, whatever, Gary Carter both realized that they said the same thing. Um, or maybe Bill Robinson was the one who actually told me, the, the late first base coach told me they all said that. But it was it was interesting because they were unaware of it until I was working on the book that they all said the same thing. And there were, I mean, I'm not a... Uh, I'm definitely not a guy who's into cliches. I hate sports cliches. I, whenever I hear, you know, we're just going to win one for whoever, or you know, it takes heart. I, you know, my ears turn off. But uh, I do think they really were sort of that team was a was a genuine testament to never giving up and to really believing and to refusing, refusing, refusing to die. And you know, I think they felt that they were meant to win the World Series that year. And by believing that, they sort of made it a uh, you know a reality. Oh, absolutely. And you look at the swagger they came in with and, and how the other teams despised them and how you got all those stories in the book about the way the teams treated them. I mean, what what do you what was the most flooring story to you when you went into these interviews? I know when you ask questions, you, you, you kind of expect answers. But what was the, the thing that shocked you the most about this, the stories that you told in this book about the Mets? Oh, they were a lot. I mean, uh, I mean <laughs> a funny one. I mean, it's been a few years now, but like uh, I went out to see Kevin Mitchell, who really became one of my favorites in that team. And... Uh, Mitchell, when I interviewed him, was the manager. Uh, he was managing an independent league ball team named the Sonoma County Crushers. And uh, I think maybe a couple months earlier, Dwight Gooden's autobiography came out. And in Dwight Gooden's book, he wrote about Kevin Mitchell cutting the head off of a cat with a kitchen knife. <laughs> and uh, I remember going up to Mitchell and saying, uh, yeah, i gotta, I got to ask you about something that was in Dwight's book. And he goes, oh, the effing cat. You gonna ask me about the effing cat? I was like, yeah. What about the cat? He's like, dude, I didn't cut a freaking cat's head off. How the heck am I gonna cut a head off of a cat with a butter knife? How the hell am I gonna do that? Give me a break. Because this is a really funny exchange with Kevin Mitchell, this guy I really grew up enjoying um, about whether or whether he did or did not 
cut the head off of a cat with a kitchen knife. Oh. And he swears he did not. That, I can't believe it. But, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. And uh, You mentioned Kevin Mitchell with him and Keith Hernandez sitting in the clubhouse during that last out. He was like half naked, Kevin Mitchell, making plane arrangements to go back to San Diego. So those guys in itself were a character. And that, that whole just final out, the superstitions of, of Keith not getting up from his spot and the stadium was like kind of rumbling. It just It's just amazing to see how you brought out all this, this good qualities of these stories that these guys had to tell. I'll tell you what it is, is that um, the one thing that's like, it's like a cliche when people say there'll never be a team like the 86 Mets and blah, blah, blah. But I actually don't think there will be a team like the 86 Mets. And I think one thing that's really changed, and I think societal-wise it's good, but anecdote-wise it's bad, is guys don't drink beer in the clubhouse anymore. So, you know, back in the day, game would be over, and all those guys would hang out. Not everyone, but most of them would hang out, pop open beers, tell stories, shoot the crap, you know, and then go out afterwards. It was a real sort of collegial you know, again, like a college fraternity where they'd all hang out and tell stories and get kind of buzzed if not wasted, you know, and now there's no beer in the clubhouse Mm -hmm. and guys don't hang out as much. It isn't the same thing. It's not like a tribe anymore. And that team was really like a tribe where they were really sort of they were like a band of brothers for that season. It was very, very unique. Oh, you know, absolutely. And you bring up a great point. I mean, always in team sports, we're saying now it's it's how the team plays. And you hear about the Red Sox, what happened in their clubhouse, you know, to get Terry Francona fired. And I think you make a great point. They were unique. And I think, you know, I think that's why a lot of Met fans in general go back to this team and look at it upon it so highly because it was a cast of characters. It was someone you could always relate to. And it just it stands out in its individuality as a baseball team. Yeah, I just I just think there's really like a uh, I don't think we have the connections to our teams the same way Met fans and even really New York fans have a connection to the '86 Mets. I mean, if you think about all the great Yankee teams of the 1990s and you know and and, and 2000s, um, yeah, like you know we were really we loved Bernie I, by we I mean New Yorkers you know love Bernie Williams and Tino and but I don't think there was that raw emotional connection to the players. You know they 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 were loved because they were productive. And they seem to be good guys. And, you know, Jeter's classic. So, you know, people love him. But there's definitely not that emotional connection, that sort of kinetic energy between fan and ball player that was there with the Mets in the, in the 80s. No, no, and and, and I, I completely agree with you there. And we're talking to Jeff Perlman, the author of The Bad Guys 1, author, so author of two other books. And I, got, I want to bring up this book, Sweetness. And I saw, you know, you're out there on Twitter. You can also follow Jeff at Jeff Perlman. And, you know, people are giving you some heat about this Walter Payton book that maybe, you know, uh, what are your thoughts about that and what people have been saying to you about the sweetness book that you wrote about Walter Payton? Well, you know, when it first came out, basically what happened is the book came out uh, last year and it was, uh, before it came out, it was excerpted in Sports Illustrated and the excerpt that Sports Illustrated ran was all about Walter's life sort of after he was done playing and it kind of talked about infidelity and uh, painkillers and sort of depression and I think a lot of people, especially sort of diehards in Chicago, were very much taken aback by that. You know, they, they, they want to know about their heroes, but they only want to know so much about their heroes. Um, and I understand that. But people were bashing me for writing sort of a book that was a, a slam Walter Payton book. And anyone who read the book, I did not, I never heard of anyone who read the book and afterwards said, you really killed Walter Payton. Because it wasn't like that. It was, I love Walter Payton. I love Walter Payton more now understanding him than I did before I ever, you know, looked up anything about him. Um, I think people were uncomfortable initially with the idea of someone coming along and writing a, a, a true biography. Uh, the truth of the matter is, uh, and there's, I don't see any way around it, is if you're going to be in the business I'm in, which is writing biographies of, of sort of historic sports figures, you can't just sugarcoat. You, know, you cannot just write all the great times. You, have to, you want to find out who this person was, what made them tick, the good and the bad, the highs and the lows. I, I think that, that's the only way you learn about someone. And... I think sometimes that makes people uncomfortable, um, and for those people, you're probably best off not reading a, a you know, the genuinely. Uh, I think thorough biographies. No, and I, I think you made a good point right there at the very end. True, real biographies aren't just about what the accolades we give this guy or or what made him a great player. Well, what, what led him to this? What drives him? And I thought, you know, I read Sweetness, and I didn't think you slammed it at all. I thought you captured it, you know, eloquently, but you, you mixed the good with the bad. And, you, you know, I didn't come out with any ill will toward Walter Payton. And I, I think people, like you said, they kind of overreact when you attack. I mean, I, I guess that's the word people use, attack their sports heroes. But like you said, if you can't handle it, don't read the biographies because the true biographies get everything about the person. Well, the other thing is this: is like uh, I don't even think of it in terms of good and bad. You know, like you just said, because I think, like, we all have our flaws. You know, we all have dark periods in our lives. You know, we all we've all faced death. 
we've all faced whatever illness we've all done things we're not proud of um and the truth of the matter is those are the things that sort of make us who we are you know like and how you how you confront those issues and how you deal with them and and i think once a person is deceased it's okay to look back at his life and try to understand who he was and and what made him tick and the highs and the lows you know like uh you know when the book first came out he didn't read it but mike dick uh, you know he made the stupid comment he would spit on me if i were there he would spit on me you know and and it's like here's this guy walter payton who mike dicker just ran and ran and ran and ran and ran and when he was done playing he was in a ton of physical pain and he, he was in a lot of mental anguish and a guy like mike dicker comes along and he says well we, we we don't need to know about this we don't need to know about this um and it's nonsense you know it's important to know about this i want to know what happens to these guys after they're done playing? I want to know the impact uh, having an NFL career has on someone. I don't just want to see the lights and the glory and the Super Bowl highlights put to you know trumpets. I want to know what what a, what a person generally goes through and what makes him succeed and also what makes him fail. Oh, absolutely, and I think you know it, it's better that way. And when you could look at your heroes and see that hey, they're human, they make mistakes, they came a long way, and you you, you kind of re- you can relate better when you have the full story about someone's life. No. I agree 100. percent I just I, I don't think there's anything. There's again I don't view it as right and wrong. I really don't. Like we all have highs, we all have lows, we all make mistakes. You know I, I I've been thinking a lot about the situation. This is a little bit of a tangent, but the situation um, with the nurse who committed suicide. Yeah. You know over the over the case. And I was thinking. So right now everybody is slamming these two DJs or whatever they are, morning people in a, in a, who made the call. Um, and it's so easy. It's just so easy. To rip on someone and to say, you know, how dare they do this? And yet, how many of these people were laughing at the prank call until it ended badly? You know, we always judge. We're so quick to judge people. And we're so, you know, to act as if we don't have our own issues and we don't have our own problems. And oh my God, the shock. I can't believe, I can't believe Walter Payton suffered depression. You know, millions of people suffer depression. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of who we are and what we go through. And I, I feel like we act like it's shameful or, or it's it's wrong or it's so horrible. I, I, I just find it ridiculous. Oh, that I- was a long... That was a long-winded rant, but it no, drives me crazy. No, you, you bring up a good point, Jeff, and, and that's why I think it's important to do the biographies the right way because, like you said, everyone has to deal with problems, and, and maybe it'll be that one person that saw that, hey, Walter Payton did suffer depression. I could speak out upon it, or, or this hero of mine had this problem, or this hero of mine did something like this. I don't have to be ashamed of that because I'm just a normal person. And I think it's a better way that society got to look at it that way instead of as looking at it as, well, we're putting him on a golden pedestal and, and he could do no wrong in our eyes. No, I agree. I mean, I actually, like, I think a good example is Martin Luther King. I mean, Martin Luther King, you know, there have been biographies written and there have been, you know, interviews done where he, you know, he, he uh, cheated on his wife, right? Mm-hmm. That does not take away from the legacy of Martin Luther King. Huh. <laughs> you know, period. It does not take away from his legacy. We all have issues. John F. Kennedy, obviously, was not the, the most loyal husband in the world. Yep. He's still John F. Kennedy. You know, Walter Payton, yes, he suffered depression. Yes, he committed adultery. He's still Walter Payton. Yep. You know, he's still the great guy who you believe in and who you enjoyed and who you loved. It doesn't, it doesn't change that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Jeff, you wrote another book about the Cowboys. I didn't get a chance to read that one yet. But do you have anything else on the horizon now? I mean, you know, you said getting ideas about different stuff. I know I saw you put out some tweets about the Knicks, maybe a Knicks book in the future. I mean, you got anything no, working? No, 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 I, 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 I'm very paranoid, so I usually don't say what exactly I'm working on. But I am doing an NBA book, but it's not about the Knicks. Oh, an NBA uh, book. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, yeah. But you are a Knicks fan, though, right? You are a Knicks fan. No, I'm not a Knicks fan. No. I actually grew up a Nets fan, a very diehard Nets fan. Oh, wait, so so how do you feel about the – well, so let's get your opinion before we let you go about the Nets moving to Brooklyn. Are you still a supporter of the team? Did they do you wrong, or, or what's going on there? No, no, no. Well, the thing is this. When you become a sports writer, you kind of lose the fan in you. So I wouldn't say I'm still a uh, – I don't really have a team I root for. I root for guys I've enjoyed covering. But, um, I mean, the Nets were like – I mean, they played in the worst arena and the worst – area nobody could go to the game so i think the brooklyn move plus their uniforms are so much better now you know i, I can't uh i think what they've done is fantastic and and you know the the rivalry they've created in new york with the knicks i mean it's almost instant yeah, it's well, been i think it's fantastic it's, it, it's instant chemistry i mean and you saw you know what watching what the nets are doing now and they're actually a decent team have you been out to the barclays center have you got to go catch the nets over there i haven't yet i i plan on going in the next couple of weeks i just haven't had a chance but i've heard i've heard great things and you know i uh it's interesting, you know. I think there are there are good stadium deals and bad stadium deals. I mean, if you look at Miami, the amount of money that the uh, 
the city of Miami had to put into that state a monstrosity of a stadium and then watch the owner dismantle the team. I think that's a that's a disgrace. Mm-hmm. But I think what what the Barclays Center is going to bring to Brooklyn and add in vibrancy. I actually think there's a real chance that it's going to be a, a huge boost to, to that area. Oh, we're going to see. It's a, like you said, instant chemistry, instant rivalry. Nets, I look forward to your next NBA book when it comes out. Hopefully we can get more details linked through Twitter. Jeff Perlman, ladies and gentlemen, at Jeff Perlman. Follow him on Twitter. Jeff, I thank you for taking out the time, and I look forward to your next book. Wow, thank you so much. Yo, thanks, Jeff. Have a good night.